Thank you very much, my Thank friend. You. Okay. <laughs> Conversations with the CEO, take one. Today we are going to talk about something that is very relevant today during this pandemic. We're going to talk about the neurosciences, in particular the Institute of Neurological Sciences of the Medical City. And I am very happy to introduce the director of the Institute. And I don't want to introduce him uh, based on what he is. He's a neurosurgeon, uh, a good neurosurgeon, but I'd like to introduce him uh, in terms of my relationship with him through the years. We were together in med school, or even during pre-med. We got together uh, more closely uh, when we were in a medical school because his name, Raselis, uh, and mine, Ramos, are just close to each other, and we were uh, actually categorized according to our family names. And then after graduation, uh, we spent internship together. We were roommates at the Medical City as interns. After that, we, our, our uh, paths diverged because I took up internal medicine and he took up surgery. And then I went on to cardiology and he went on to neurosurgery. And after that, he, he really went up and really trained under people uh, in uh, who's who in uh, Philippine neurosurgery, uh, Dr. Sibayan, Dr. Aldenese, and he became the, uh, the president of the uh, uh, Academy of uh, Filipino, Filipino uh, Neurosurgeons. No? I took my cardiology training uh, outside because we did not have training in medical city at that time. And then, well, he is now the uh, head of the Institute of uh, of uh, neurological sciences, which is actually composed of three departments. One is the department of neurology, headed by uh, Dr. J.J. Chongson. The uh, department of neurosurgery, under him, uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Almario Habson. And the department of psychiatry, under Dr. Monica Cardinestan. So it's a big institute. And he assumes control over that in terms of putting, giving the directions and providing substance to the, the, the field of neurosciences. Today, uh, the uh, Institute of Neurological Sciences is really very relevant in these times because one, there has been a lot of uh, uh, neurological disorders and strokes requiring either uh, neurological management or surgery because of COVID. There has been a lot of problems with mental health issues because of the COVID uh, pandemic that has been prolonged. And overall, I think there has been a need for people to adjust to this pandemic. You know, the stresses, the new normal that we're talking about requires a changing of mindsets and which is still under neurosciences. And that's precisely why our talk today is going to be really relevant, precisely because we want to focus on how do we improve the way Filipinos think as far as uh, mindsets are concerned. A lot of the things that we now uh, see the uh, incompetence of, uh, of people in leadership positions, the corruption that we see, the unending economic uh, burdens of the uh, pandemic is putting a strain on all of us in the way we react, the way we adapt, and also the way we look at how are we going to now move on from here to there? Is there going to be a are going back to how it was before? Definitely not. And how do we now adapt? So that's precisely why today's uh, talk I have with Dr. Louis Rosales. No? He is the uh, director of the uh, Institute of Neurological Sciences. It's going to be really interesting. As a matter of fact, last year, uh, because of the pandemic, we organized uh, a meeting, a lecture by him, and he talked about the unwiring of the Filipino brain. And it was geared towards 
why do Filipinos think the way they do? And I would like to pursue that because he was not really able to finish uh, that. Now, that was supposed to be a two-part lecture and we were able to finish just one part. So, Louis, mm -hmm. welcome back. Thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. now it's the chance for us to talk about, you know, uh, we are already in our mid-60s. Mm -hmm. We are already thinking of defining our, our ourselves in terms of how do we contribute. We are way past all those uh, achievements that are, you know, that kind of motivate younger people uh, to, to uh, achieve. Mm -hmm. We are now here in terms of how do we contribute to the people below us and uh, the people uh, under us. No? So uh, maybe you can start with where is neuroscience at this time? Well, at, at this point, uh, let me thank you for the invitation and the generous introduction. And a second thank you for supporting the Institute, uh, spurring the formation of the Institute of Neurological Sciences and uh, of course supporting it these past years. Uh, just to go on a very small definition of uh, what that institute means, it's putting together what we call the experts in a particular field or a group of experts that manage a particular part of the body, an organ, and so on. And in our case, of course, when we call it neurological sciences, it pertains to the nervous system. So that's what the Institute roughly means. You put them together, they can collaborate uh, easier, faster uh, that way. And when we need to go on a multidisciplinary meeting with other institutes or other experts, it's far easier to do that when you already have a formed group uh, such as an institute that carry all the specialties needed in addressing symptoms referable to the nervous system. So you have neurosurgery, neurology, and of course, for the mind, uh, psychiatry. So in, in a sum, that's what an institute needs. And then you have the various centers that cater to subsets or subspecialties within a specialty of, uh, uh, let's say, neurology or neurosurgery, uh, say strokes, tumors, and so on. And that's what an institute means. So you can have institutes for the heart, uh, for the lungs, for the thorax, for the brain, and so on. It's be best to define institutes, uh, as the question was, in terms of where we are today. Today we have formed uh, the various departments that are necessary for the Institute uh, Psychiatry. We have strengthened those, created programs to help not just patients uh, outside of the hospital, but within the hospital as well. And it was vital in this pandemic that the mental health of not just the frontline frontline workers, uh, hospital care workers, um, and doctors themselves uh, to be maintained throughout this pandemic because you cannot address major problems in this pandemic in treating people. If you yourself were ill of in the mind, uh, stressed out, uh, so those, had, those issues were recognized early on in the pandemic. Uh, more specifically by the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, and they quickly crafted programs to address specific problems related to the pandemic. And consequences of illnesses actually, for those patients who, were, uh, who contracted COVID and were admitted were likewise uh, entered into programs addressing mental health issues arising from being ill of COVID. And uh, understandably, if a patient was ill, the entire family would have uh, their own concerns, uh, fear, anxiety, and uh, depression probably, and all of those which accompanied, uh, in a sense, one patient in a family being ill, and you can have an entire family being stressed out. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, uh, everybody knew and realized that this uh, early on that this uh, pandemic was not an ordinary flu case. It was, it was a totally different thing. And when the mortality rates were being published, it added to the stresses. And it had an effect on the entire population, uh, not just certainly for the Philippines, but uh, for the entire world. 
uh, one of the things that we saw early on was that there was a lack of information on doing this and that and addressing this uh, pandemic touched from the bad leadership that we saw early on. A very topsy-turvy way of uh, addressing the issues uh, um, in the Philippines that contrasted very well, very different from our closest neighbors. Uh, of course, uh, from the very beginning, we knew that we, we didn't have the resources uh, that our neighbors had, uh, maybe except for a few countries in ASEAN. But certainly um, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, our closest neighbors had the resources to tackle that. But even then, they found it difficult. So we did find it very difficult. The worst thing about having a pandemic like of this magnitude is having the pandemic and bad leadership. <laughs> it doesn't go together. And uh, we saw that in countries that had those conditions as well. In South America, maybe the U.S. Uh, at that time. Uh, and of course, in this part of the world, maybe some of the countries in ASEAN. But notably in our country, uh, we saw it very well. And we in the health sector recognized that there was a lot to be desired in terms of addressing the issues that needed to be uh, addressed, very not just very quickly, but needed a depth in terms of understanding what it was that we were facing. And so when we saw that early on in the months, we now have one of the highest rates uh, in terms of number of people relative to the population that are infected. And uh, much of that has to do with early mismanagement uh, in the course of the pandemic. Which is also basically bad behavior, isn't it? It's bad behavior. Yes. And uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you touched early on on uh, wiring, which is actually what it is. Uh, why, when, when we use the word wiring, it is actually based on how that person, I'm talking of a, in, it in a singular sense. If, if a child were wired to be upright, Let's say parents are very moral, very ethical, and you wire that person to be that way early on. The likelihood that that person as an adult will be ethical and moral will be very high as well. And as, and as a contrast to that, if a child, say, in, grew up in the slums and all around were thieves and uh, the the parents who are not guiding that child, the likelihood that that child will grow up to be a criminal would be very high. So it, that is what wiring is. You wire them on early so that you don't have to unwire them in the past to rewire them again as an adult. You wire them very early on. So th that is what I'm talking about as a sense of wiring. And I used as an example uh, in the past when I lectured, a, a river, the Pasig River. The Pasig River is actually akin to saying this is the Filipino. And the result, the Pasig River is actually a result of tribu tributaries that joined together. We had the lake, Laguna uh, Dubai, which forms the Pasig River. If the tributaries are dirty, and uh, the lake is dirty, the Pasig River will be dirty. Mm. You clean up the bay, you clean up the tributaries, the Pasig River will become clean. And that is what we want to achieve for the Filipino. You clean up the youth, the way you wire them, you end up with a population in the future. We cannot do it now, but certainly we can do it for the next one or two generations if we start, start wiring them down. Mm -hmm. and, no, and nowhere is it more important than to do it at the time of a pandemic. Because if we don't rewire the Filipino, if we don't elect leaders that will wire the Filipino in a correct fashion, the Philippines cannot rise as a nation comparable to the nations, to, the, to our closest neighbors that are already uh, well on their way to becoming uh, the first world. 
that's why we say that uh, every six years we change our leaders and we begin again. We, we begin are, again. We are perpetual beginners. We are, we, right. Yes, because we have not been able to unwire and rewire. Mm. And that's what we need to do. So, uh, of course, that's true for all nations. But for nations that have wired their population, and I was just talking to a, a German friend of mine. He said, in Germany, if the government announces that tomorrow you drive on the other lane, the likelihood that that nation will follow is very high. Very high. They are wired or disciplined enough to accept that when an instruction is given to do things one way, the likelihood that they will, that follow. They will follow is very high because Germans are wired to be disciplined and wired correctly to follow uh, government when they say this is the best thing for you. And, and if you're not wired like that, then what we see is what we see today, uh, uh, chaos you know, in every strata, in every level of society. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> the, the thing about uh, our current society is the fact that not only do we wallow in poverty, we uh, suffer poor leadership, we have definitely uh, inadequate resources as far as economics is concerned. We definitely have to improve our education mm -hmm. and uh, our healthcare uh, system uh, should actually uh, band together with education and economics in terms of making sure that the children grow properly in terms of their nutrition, in terms of early education and in terms of guidance towards love for country. Mm -hmm. Now, that is quite a, a big uh, ambition for us at this point. No? And sometimes because it's overwhelming, we just don't know where to begin, correct? Right? Now, as far as the Neuro Institute is concerned, we, we do handle, of course, diseases as they come. And diseases like strokes, they are supposed to be either, you know, if, uh, if we can reverse it, then we reverse it. And then the patient goes back to how it was before. Mm -hmm. uh, if it be, if it's a it's a neurosurgical uh, condition, we remove the tumor mm -hmm. and the patient goes back. Mm -hmm. In the case of psychiatry, uh, you know, uh, some some uh, psychotherapy perhaps, or maybe some uh, of the medications that are to uh, kind of control uh, the the. What is it? Mind, uh, yeah, the mind, mind in, in terms of the synopsis and everything yes. uh, can also modify that. Mm -hmm. But we, you know that it, this is at that level already. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, uh, Louis, is the Neurological uh, Institute, uh, Sciences Institute that you had, apparently has much bigger uh, responsibilities or maybe uh, not a responsibility, but uh, in terms of the expanse of the, the the things that you can do in collaboration, I guess, with the other uh, segments of society mm -hmm. that that can lead to that. Now, research would probably be something that you, we can in, do here in, in Medical City. Um, the kind of uh, people that lead the different clinical departments of the Neuro Institute also would have defined exactly how how the Neurological Institute is going to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how do you see the uh, Institute um, moving on five years from now? Oh, it's not just five years. We have to look farther than that. Mm -hmm. We have to look uh, 10 years and maybe beyond. Uh, okay. We have to look at good. <laughs> uh, yes, good. because five years is really short. Okay. Uh, my idea is really to look at the current technology, and then uh, what can be applied. Because of course, not every technology will succeed in the future. And to, to it's it's really picking out which ones that we currently need and we likely need in the next few years, picking them out, and hopefully we can bring it bring it here and use them, of course. Uh, there are technologies that have uh, emerged in the past few years. Notably, for example, uh, artificial intelligence in, in its use in uh, the neurosciences would be almost indispensable. I can see a point in time where the use of AI in uh, neurological diagnosis orders, yeah. not just diagnosis, but in treatment, mm -hmm. uh, would, would, would at one point be indispensable. 
And uh, I can actually foresee a point where if a human would be treated by another human, that human might feel insulted. Because Meaning the treatment and the diagnosis given by artificial intelligence will probably exceed that of a human. So I, I can see see that point. Maybe not in the next five years, maybe not even in a so decade. In, in, in but effect, within this century, that will in, happen. In effect, you're saying that while the institute is going to focus on the nervous system, mm -hmm. the nervous system may eventually be artificial intelligence. Yes, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> now and that will happen this century, mm -hmm. and maybe just maybe. Uh, this generation of doc young doctors that are graduating today will probably experience something like that. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't look at it in terms of separating the two. I think artificial intelligence for a long time will remain a tool. It will not be independent, meaning there will still be humans that will direct. Because you need to have the, the vision of what this uh, artificial intelligence devices will mm -hmm. do. They will remain artificial. The, the word artificial will forever be, be attached to, mm -hmm. the, to that uh, kind of technology. Now, starting today and moving onwards, I was just focusing myself on five years, uh, basically because uh, I think, I think uh, while we understand where it's headed, we don't really, we can never really predict how it's going to be. You know, the technology can go this way, mm -hmm. it looks like it's going this way at this time, mm -hmm. but it can go this way or even expand some more and totally reinvent itself. No? But uh, what we know for a fact is the starting point. The starting point is now here. And we are dealing now with our own uh, uh, doctors, young doctors and trainees. We are training, uh, training psychiatrists, we're training neurologists, we're training neurosurgeons. No? And uh, your legacy. You know, in terms of the neurosurgeries, the the neurosurgeons, the young neurosurgeons that we are producing, I think they're top notch. You know? mm -hmm. uh, we we are also uh, really uh, uh, gaining a lot of ground as far as neurology uh, training is concerned. Our psychiatry training is top notch as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it really depends on where as leaders now, where we where we would like them to 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 uh, pro project towards. In other words, uh, you think as far as the medical city uh, is concerned, or at least your institute is concerned, we have uh, put in or uh, set the necessary uh, uh, elements to provide the kind of preparation that is partly also unwiring and rewiring them, Yes. right? Yes. Uh, that's uh, as far as we can go, no? Because we cannot go back to history, but as far as the present is concerned, we can start in terms of how do we prepare these young doctors to look at the future with a totally different mindset that does not cause them to be burdened by their past practices and their, you know, their, uh, their own histories, no? Let's face it, quite a number of things that uh, our parents taught us, we need to unlearn, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at this point, we can, we can decide what are the things that needs to be relearned for our graduates or our young trainees to move forward. Because I think as far as we are concerned, you know, we are in our mid 60s, we can only go so far. And all we need to do is to provide the necessary elements for the future for them to uh, pick up and, and, and uh, progress by themselves. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, really, uh, maybe in terms of closing, uh, looking at the current situation, the pandemic that we have, looking at the way our own staff, I'm not talking about the doctors alone, but everybody else, no, and even the trainees, how are uh, our people in Medical City are reacting or responding or adapting to these absolutely new changes that we never anticipated. How do we, in one way or another, alleviate, facilitate, or at least help in their, their uh, adaptation? in other words, mm -hmm. so that we can at least say, hey, 
at least, you know, we have done so far. We have gone so far and we have done so much. And uh, I think we are happy. Well, well uh, in, in a sense, this is what I introduced that's a bit different in the Institute of uh, other hospitals that I'm familiar with, uh, in, in not just in the country, but in uh, other countries as well. Uh, I, I learned this actually from a German uh, when I went on a um, workshop uh, years back. You're a Merkel. Uh, uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a fan <laughs> of the Germans. Not, uh, not okay. because for for uh, yeah, well the, for a good reason. The, for, for a good reason. reason. Yes, for, for a, a good, good reason. reason. And he actually his, his name is Dr. Axel uh, Bernetsky. He, uh and I, I briefly trained uh, uh, neuroendoscopic procedures under him. Uh, this was just for a workshop. But anyway, what he said was, if you change someone's way of thinking, the philosophy, then down the line, that philosophy will probably breed to propagate, propagate uh, mm -hmm. and come up with new philosophies. Yes. And I look back at my own uh, uh, experience when I was in neurosurgery under training as a resident, and I and I look at my surgeries today, and I cannot recognize what I did as a resident with the way I do things now. They are vastly different. And I cannot put myself back and say, is that how I did it in the past? Mm -hmm. it's, this is a, the things that I do today are, are so different. Meaning through time in, Three well, decades. Technology has changed. Has changed the yeah. way I do things, and that's what I want, wanted to impart to my resident. You look at things with an open mind, and you are lucky in Medical City, and I told them, because Medical City is like a melting pot. We have the finest neurosurgeons in the various institutes and other hospitals within Metro Manila found in Medical City, and so you are exposed to diverse. Various, various and very diverse mm -hmm. techniques in doing surgery. You pick out the ones that work for you, pick out what you think are best, and you should technically come out, graduate from neurosurgery in Medical City better than any of your mentors. Because if you did not do that, if that, that did not happen, then neurosurgery did not grow. And that's what I want to see in the future. The best reward that I think and satisfaction uh, of, a, of a teacher, of a mentor, is to see a pupil become better yeah. than the mentor. Than the mentor. Mm -hmm. Because, it, and it is the reason you don't put them down, you yeah. elevate them. You elevate them. Mm -hmm. And so neurosurgery in that sense grows as a spiral upward. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. grow downward because you, you, encourage your graduates to become and likewise, better. likewise, when they reach your age, they do the same thing. They do the same thing. And yes. that's the propagation yes, of the, right. the specialty the, itself. The kind of culture. And, and it is what's being done. I see it in neurology and in psychiatry as well. So the institute grows that way. Mm. There is a continually uh, rise, rising of the bar. You raise that level every year or every few months. And we can see that in our graduates, <clears throat> we can see the residents. I can now see, for example, our senior residents better than I was when, when I was a senior resident. resident. So I, I tell myself, okay, what I've, uh, what I've seen through the years, I can uh, now, in a sense, brag uh, that my uh, graduates are going to be better than I am. And I can, I can see that in neurology as well, uh, that we have a program that's now uh, more than a decade old, a decade and a half almost, in neurology. Um, and it has produced outstanding graduates uh, that are now in, uh, creating an impact in the communities that, uh, that they have uh, practiced, ended up in. And we are now getting the referrals from our own graduates here in the medical city, I can see also that the uh, graduates that we have produced are starting to lord it over in terms of uh, getting their own patients. Expertise. So that's that's what we're we're seeing. You change the philosophy of uh, your own uh, trainees, and you can already project that in the future, 
they will create the changes. Today, the pandemic has produced, in, in quotation marks, some kind of advantage. It's making people realize that you have to have speed and agility mm. in adapting to changes. Mm. Without speed and agility, I think it's very easy in a year or two with the way technology progresses, with the way computers are becoming uh, faster, rapid in doing this. It's very easy to be left behind. And speed and agility in uh, adapting to these changes are very important. We know we have to change. We know that. What matters is how fast can we do that? Yeah. And uh, if, uh, if that cannot be achieved, then... And how to remove all those all unnecessary... Unnecessary, the clutter, that the clutter, I call them yes. the clutter. Mm -hmm. you, you need to separate the clutter yes. from what is truly important. I think if I can summarize, Louis, uh, you know, this discussion, and we can go <laughs> on and on, right? The uh, thing about our graduates and the philosophy that you talk about and uh, trying to propagate this and to change it is also in a way, how do we unwire and rewire? And when you talk about this, it's about, when you talk about speed and agility, one is that you realize that in this pandemic, there is no way that you can do things by yourself. Yes. You need to work as a team, mm -hmm. right? And the unlearning part here is that this is, not, this is not all about you. It's all about the bigger team. And to reward ourselves to be able to say, in what way can I contribute to the bigger good rather than to myself? I think that's the philosophy of the graduates learning as much as they can, adapting to the changes that are happening. And at the same time, when the time comes that they contribute, they contribute by actually stepping aside mm -hmm. and giving the younger ones a chance to prove their worth mm -hmm. and to likewise continue exactly how we would like this to be in terms of unlearning and relearning. Mm -hmm. So with that, Louis, I would just to say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, my thank friend. You. Okay, thank you. My pleasure.